Um, the story of the Second International is a story of a struggle against opportunism. And what the opportunism, we basically usually talk about reformism today. And it's the death of one international and the beginnings of a new one. And that's when we come to Simmerwald. It, it contains important political lessons for us, uh, for our work today. In particular, of course, in the struggle against reformism as well as centrism. We should remember that this is one side of the coin, if you will. There's also the struggle against ultra-leftism. And the struggle to maintain a Marxist position is always a struggle between these two different tendencies. But uh, the struggle against ultra-leftism is mainly the story of the first few years of the Third International. Um, the voting of the Social Democrats uh, across Europe for war And we're talking about World War One. It was the cum culmination of a long period of reformist degeneration. <laughs> as I will try to explain. And Simon Wald, in a sense, was the first attempt to try to overcome the treachery of, of uh, those parties. I'll, I will focus on the German organization, the German party. And other than the fact, I know very little about the other parties. It was also by far the biggest party, and also the one which was seen as the model for the rest to follow. The Second International was born in the period of the capitalist boom. Uh, the economic growth in Germany of the 1880s was 25% over the decade. In the 1890s, it was 39%. And in the first decade of the 20th century, it was 29. If you compare that to the, the period that followed, between 1913 and 1925, the German economy shrunk with 11%. And between 1925 and 32, once again, it shrunk with 11 percent. And this period that we're talking about is the period of European imperialism dominating the world.
It was the time when the world was divided between the European powers. Where the scramble for Africa in the late 19th century. And the um, uh, exploitation of the colonies and the super profits. Enabled certain uh, concessions to be given, particularly to one layer of the working class. Um, I'm going to quote a little bit from, mainly from Lenin in this session. It's, he says, comments on this, that there is a tendency of the bourgeoisie and the opportunists. <laughs> to convert a handful of very rich and privileged nations in, into eternal parasites on the body of the rest of mankind. I apologize to the translators. To rest on the laurels of the exploitation of Negroes, Indians, etc. Keeping them in subjugation with the aid of excellent weapons of extermination provided by modern militarism. <laughs> and you have what is created as a crust at the top of a working class, the privileged layer. <laughs> Uh, the labor aristocracy or the labor bureaucracy, as we might call it today. Um, um, Lenin commented in 1915 that the desertion of a stratum of the labor aristocracy to the bourgeoisie has matured and become an accomplished fact. And he's obviously talking with the vote for the imperialist war it has become an accomplished fact. But it wasn't just economic concessions, but also political concessions. With the freedom of speech and the right to vote. A certain layer of the working class or their representatives were granted uh, privileges. <laughs> The right to participate in parliamentary assemblies, make speeches and so on. And Lenin once again comments that they have created political privileges and SOPs. For the respectful, meek, reformist and patriotic office employees and workers. <laughs> office employees and workers. So we're talking here about the beginnings of a, a, a labor movement bureaucracy.
Alongside this came the building of the labor movement. And uh, the German party was the, really the pinnacle of the achievement. In 1871, they managed to get 3.2% of the vote, the popular vote. 3.2. 71. Uh, in 1890, at the end of uh, the period of illegality, they got 20% of the vote. By 1912, 35% of the vote. So this was just before the outbreak of war. They basically commanded a third of the electorate. And at the, be and at the very beginning of the German Revolution, in 1918, the SPD and the USPD to ma together managed to achieve 45% of the vote. So you can see the tremendous influence that the German Social Democratic Party at this time had. Even in, even in this period of relative calm in the class struggle. They built up a massive apparatus of full-timers and newspapers. Uh, the newspaper circulation, daily newspaper circulations, was 1,465,000 copies. <laughs> and they had uh, 3,500 employees in the press. Which were also the party officials. And they had over 3,000 trade union officials. Um, the trade union movement was able to wrest concessions from the bosses. It got concessions from the bosses in this period. The trade union has managed to get concessions from the bosses. They managed to win the right to collective bargaining in many industries. And this helped them develop into a mass force. I'll try to go through a little bit of the history. But it's a bit... Um, uh, the early part is very interesting, but I don't really have time to deal with it. But in spite of a reputation of German social democracy, even in the very early foundation years of the party, they had uh, big clashes with Marx and Engels. And you can see the beginning of the op uh, you can see an opportunist tendency already at the start. And Marx and Engels were very critical of this. Uh, 
Uh, in the period of illegality, there was a t turn to the left in the party. And the air foot program of 1891 was a big improvement on the Goethe pro previous program. And Engels, who was still alive at this time, he recognized this. But he noted a few points where there were of weakness. In particular, when it came to the question of the state. And on the question of uh, revolution. <laughs> and he uh, thought that there was a fear of um, uh, renewed repression that made them tone down their writing. <laughs> he wrote. Fearing a renewal of the anti-socialist law, they now want the party to find the present legal order in Germany adequate. These are attempts to convince the party that present day society is developing towards socialism. Without asking whether it will not have to burst, whether it will not have to burst this old shell by force. Well, I think this quite kind of describes what uh, the problems that I begin to see. He continues. This striving for the success of the moment. Regardless of later consequences, <laughs> is and remains opportunism. <laughs> and honest, in inverted commas, <laughs> honest opportunism is perhaps the most dangerous of all. <laughs> So in general, he saw this as a step forward, this program. Already at this point, he, could see, he was worried about the theoretical weaknesses of the party. And just before Engels' death, there was another inc incident. Uh, where the party leadership uh, edited a text that Engels had written. <laughs> and Engels was furious. He said they make me look like a pacifist. <laughs> And he demanded that they publish the original text in the theoretical journal. Yeah. But uh, they uh, sort of uh, stalled for time. And Engels died. And the party leadership kept this uh, incident hidden from the membership. So you can see here some of the, uh, the tendencies are starting to develop tentatively. So 
The party leadership saw theory as something that was uh, secondary. <laughs> it was useful for the purpose of building the organization. But a serious discussion on, on the theory and uh, tactics is not something they were prepared to engage in. So you have this situation where on the one hand they would defend Marxism in abstract. They will defend it in speeches and writings, etc. But when it came to practice, they were adopting completely different methods. And uh, eventually, these kind of contradictions have to get an outlet somehow. And there were several minor controversies within the party in this period. But the first open controversy was that with uh, Bernstein. And Bernstein was uh, openly argued for a reformist approach. I think the comrades might have heard the expression the, uh, the road is everything, the goal is nothing, or something to that effect. So the movement is everything, the final goal is nothing, as I'm saying. And Bernstein was leaning on local government officials that have been elected. <laughs> Particularly in the south of the country, where the franchise was less restricted. <coughs> but also increasing the trade unions were the major uh, opportunist pressure on the party. And there was, um, these groups have something in common. A constantly evolving compromises and deals with the bourgeoisie. Uh, when it comes to trade union, this is a uh, natural order of things. A trade union cannot always be on strike. And you, you always have to find temporary agreements, uh, ceasefires and so on. And this starts putting an opportunist pressure on those involved with this. And in a similar way, the local government, local parliamentarians in the south, they started making deals in local government with uh, the so-called left of the bourgeoisie. So you know the Stalinists often talk about this, the, this uh, nebulous progressive bourgeoisie. Well, the German Social Democrats were constantly looking for a deal with the progressives. 
as they were called. Who, uh, who played the role of kind of stretching a hand out to the Social Democrats from the ha on behalf of the bourgeoisie. But also in key moments withdrawing that outstretched hand. And thus trying to nudge the parliamentarians towards the ruling class. <coughs> uh, but uh, Bernstein basically threw down the gauntlet, as I say, challenged the party leadership. Uh, on the question of Marxist theory. He started off just questioning a few aspects here and there. And like uh, all revisionists, he started off with the question of dialectics. <laughs> Trying to divorce <coughs> dialectics from uh, Marxism. Yeah. Uh, and you uh, can see that in acad academic literature ever since. <laughs> we try to uh, uh, cut away the young Marx or the Hegelian Marx from the later moderate reformist Marx. <laughs> Or at a different change, Marx, who was reformist, and Engels, who was a revolutionary. But gradually, as the debate progressed, Bernstein had to admit that he disagreed with everything in Marxism. The theory of value, the class struggle. So this was quite a challenge to the party, really. But for about a year, there was no response from the party leadership whatsoever. And Bernstein was allowed to publish his writings in the theoretical journal of the party. Which was, uh, which was published by, uh, which was edited by the left winger Karl Kautsky. But uh, the, uh, the young generation, they grew, grew furious with this prevarication of the leadership. And in many local papers, they started writing articles against Bernstein. And there were, uh, it was uh, Luxembourg, it was Parvus, who later Kutowski co cooperated with. And I think Mehring as well, I can't quite remember. And uh, the response and the outcry on the part of the party left pushed the leadership uh, into action. And both Bebel and Kautsky wrote articles uh, attacking Bernstein. Uh, 
Gunshine kritisierten. But they were of a slightly uh, dry character. They were a little bit abstract. And they, um, they basically amounted to saying to trying to prove that Bernstein was arguing against Marxism. But they weren't defending Marxism as such. Um, strong paper. And um, Bernstein was kind of, he wasn't really impressed with the response of the party leadership. He had cooperated, collaborated with Engels and so on for a long time. And uh, he, he was quite theoretically able. And uh, quite honest revisionist as well. So he actually said that, well, actually, Luxembourg's response is the only serious one. Well, we could also add that uh, some of the other lefts, as well as uh, the one that Plekhanov wrote in the Russian press. But the key question that Luxembourg focused on was the question of dialectics. And the series of articles that you wrote became known as Reform or Revolution. <laughs> and she basically explains how this period of reforms and concessions on the part of the ruling class will eventually come to an end. Which will, and will open up a new period of class struggle and revolution. And though it would take about 15 years for, or 12 years or something for this to start to occur, you can see that she was actually right. Many in the leadership, on the contrary, basically held the position uh, in private that, pri uh, that Bernstein was correct. But one does not say such things in public. So in a cynical way, they were using Marxism in order to be like a May Day speeches and so on. And also as a kind of a cover for their own revisionist and reformist politics. And this was the first serious warning sign. The party was starting to polarize. With uh, Luxembourg on the left. But also uh, other characters that we will see later on in the German, in the Spartacus Bund. Like Franz Mehring, uh, Clara Zetkin, and Karl Liebknecht at this point was very young, but he started to appear as well. Uh, 
On the right, you had Bernstein and the group around Socialistische Monatshefte. And this uh, was an open revisionist journal, publishing articles in favor of imperialism and so on. And obviously in favor of uh, reformism and against revolution. But it was also a breach of party discipline. Because this organ was not under the control of the party. And all the left wing, uh, the publications that were controlled by the left were all party organs, official party organs. <laughs> Um, then in the um, center you had Babel and Kautsky. And they were trying to cover up the differences that were emerging in the party. Whereas the left was demanding a discussion on this question and also action. But uh, following party congress, the party leadership tried to keep it off the agenda. And uh, Clara Setkin forced it onto the agenda. In the discussion on the press, she started attacking the, uh, the weak response of the party to Bernstein's challenge. Which obviously opened the floodgates and everyone started uh, debating. And there were two uh, uh, votes at that party congress and at the, uh, the next party congress. Which went uh, decisively against the revisionists. Because the party leadership threw their weight behind, uh, well, against them. But at the same time, they, they opposed the left's demand for their expulsion. And so they were kept inside the party. In spite of reaching party discipline, and obviously having a completely revisionist position on these questions. And so you can see here the leadership's role become uh, of defending, at in this period, of defending the revisionists against the attacks from the left. And in reality, defending them against the party majority's position. In the period of 1905 to 1906, the left tried to go on defense of the question of the mass strike. Uh, or general strike, as we would call it. And although, um, uh, I mean, Doris the, the Luxemburg wrote a whole book on this question. Where she uh, overemphasizes the role of spontaneity in the revolution. 
And you can see a little bit in the way that left was posing this question, even in this period. You can see a little bit of the traces of that, even in how the debate was conducted in the party that time. Of this uh, overemphasis of spontaneity. <laughs> And you can see how, but it was an attempt of the party left to break out and force the party into action. In particular on the question of universal suffrage. And the question of, of general strike uh, for universal suffrage was a question that was taken up in many sections of the Second International. And the party leadership kind of accepted this policy. And for the last time, they shifted to the left, under pressure. And uh, Kautsky uh, remained, uh, supported the mass strike and so on. And he kept arguing in, on the side of the left in this debate. But the following period was a period of mild reaction in Europe, particularly in Germany. Well, if you include Russia, you could say there was a period of severe reaction, but... And the economic downturn, there was a minor downturn in the economy in this particular period. And uh, it polarized society. And the uh, emperor saw the opportunity to try to give the social democrats a push. And they uh, mobilized on the colonial question and the question of imperialism. You must defend the fatherland, you must defend the Kaiser and so on. It was a period of heightened international tensions. <laughs> and Germany trying to push at the limits which the British Empire had set it. So in the election of in the election of 1907, the bourgeois camp solidified. And all the parties, even the so-called progressive bourgeoisie, they aligned themselves with the empire and the Kaiser. And the SPD lost almost half their MPs in the national parliament. In spite of the fact that they gained half a million votes. Yeah, the, uh, another half a million compared to the previous elections. So one more, another, yeah. An additional half a million votes. <laughs> and what it was was that the progressives they had a transferable vote system. That is, you got a second preference. So you, could, you had a first preference candidate and a second preference candidate in the elections. <laughs> Oh no, so, sorry, that was wrong. They had a round system, so you had the first round of the election and the second round of the election. Yeah. 
The French comrades would be familiar with the system. And in the second round, whereas in the past some of the progressive votes had transferred to the Social Democrats, in this particular election, they all went to the right. And this proved a decisive turning point in the social democratic history. Uh, trade unions had long been on, have been on the warpath ever since the discussion on the mass strike. They, they saw that entire policy as adventurism. They uh, saw it as a threat to their collective bargaining agreements, their uh, rec union recognition, and so on. And uh, uh, in 19, at the Stuttgart International Congress, they carried out a bit of a coup. Uh, using the Congress delegation of, uh, for the Stuttgart conference, they uh, managed to half repeal the previous position on the mass strike. Uh, they basically gave the, they presented the uh, party leadership with an ultimatum. And the balance of forces in the delegation of the, um, uh, of the German Social Democracy to the International Congress was very much in favour of right. And that was because of a trade union vote. And uh, the German um, uh, delegation supported a particularly disgusting resolution that was put forward at the Congress. Which basically said that social democracy could be in favor of socialist colonies. Uh, as a civilizing measure. And Lenin commented uh, civilizing people with liquor and uh, syphilis. <laughs> and you can see here how the pressure uh, in the election campaign was finding its way into the party. Yeah, in particular the tops of the party. And if there's one thing you know about MPs, if, if there's one thing you know about parliamentarians, it's that they get very upset when they lose their seat. And so uh, the whole, the party apparatus was shifting to the right. Uh, the, this particular resolution failed to pass. Uh, in spite of the German delegation. 
But this was the first time when the German party came out clearly on the right wing in the international. Uh, and Kautsky correctly opposed this resolution. As well as the left, of course. And uh, Lenin commented in, in an article in the Social Democrat in the Russian press. That accepting this resolution would have been an outright assertion to the bourgeois point of view. In spite of all the talk about socialism. And the next flashpoint came in 1910-1911. And as I said, the, um, the, the suffrage in the South was relatively permissive. Like it was more almost universal suffrage in the South of Germany. But in uh, Prussia, which was the most populous and uh, largest region, I'm not sure, it's probably about a third of the population and a similar amount of uh, land. They maintained a free class franchise. Where basically the rich got you know, many, many more times the number of votes as the poor. And the workers started to move uh, against this, demanding reform. There were several mass protests in Berlin. And in particular, after one, uh, there, was, there were clashes with the police. And then the following demonstration was banned. I can't remember the parks now, but... The, the, and the party then called, the local party called for a demonstration in one park. Well, it wasn't a demonstration, it was a walk in the park. And the uh, police obviously mobilized and they surrounded the whole park with police vans, uh, not vans, but police and officers and horses and that. <laughs> but the, social, the party was so well organized, they actually managed to, on the morning, give the location of a different park. They gave the location in the morning of a different park. And so a couple of hundred thousand workers turned up in this other park and not in the one where the police were. Obviously to the great embarrassment of the German police. And the press was furious, saying they're preparing revolution. Look how they can organize, this is just one step away from revolution. And, and you can see that if there was a mood there that was developing among the masses. And Luxembourg saw it as an opportunity to go on the offensive. Yeah. 
and demanded that the party support the local strikes in, in preparation for a general strike. And all across Germany there was a mood among the workers that were developing in favour of this. And precisely for that reason, they, uh, they refused to publish Luxembourg's articles. And this is both the national party leadership as well as uh, Karl Kautsky in the theoretical journal. <laughs> and both the leadership and Kautsky came out uh, hard against this position. <laughs> We saw it uh, as adventurism. They were going to risk everything they built up. And they threw the whole weight to try to prevent the workers from mobilizing. And they let the movement peter out. It's worth saying a few things about Karl Kautsky. He was uh, known as the Pope of Marxism. He was considered the foremost theoretical authority in this period. And he edited the theoretical journal, Neue Zeit, as I said. And there, he had uh, certain qualities as a theoretician. Uh, two of his books, which uh, Lenin would recommend. I think it's, uh, it's the one on Christianity. But also, uh, I think it's called The Way to Power, is that right? Yeah. The Road to Power, yeah. <laughs> From 1907, as uh, Hans yeah. pointed out. Yeah. And actually, the, uh, Lenin was very approving of this side of Kautsky. Um, but his uh, theory had a slightly abstract, a slightly academic character. He never could quite uh, connect the uh, struggles of the working class to the academic or the, the Marxist theory. Um, so his defense of Marxist theory had this slightly abstract character. And he even complained in personal correspondence about the position that he held in the movement. He complained in personal correspondence, personal letters, about the position, uh, Kautsky, about the position that he held in the movement. Yeah. Himself. No, I'll explain why. He was very uncomfortable with being this kind of uh, theoretician at the head of the movement. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he said he would much rather have a quiet life <laughs> to study history and so on. And, and you, can, you can see a little bit that character of him coming through in what he writes and how he acts. <laughs> He shies away from controversy. 
And he doesn't quite have the characters to stand up to the right wing. And certainly after Babel starts shifting to the right, uh, after 1907, he follows Babel. And the more that the pressure of events and the revolution started to building up in Germany, Kautsky, in order to avoid adventurism, had to move further and further to the right. And uh, this was this um, this period was the first time where he openly sided with the right wing and the opportunists, the conservatives. And like in many parts of Europe, the period 1910 to 1914 saw so an increased radicalization in the working class. And particularly on the industrial front, in the trade unions. And uh, the trade union leaders got very worried about this. And you can see it's, they act just like the trade union leaders do today. They were very worried about the strength of the bosses. And they tried to stop any strike from taking place. For fear that it might fail. And basic, and this led to wave of wildcat strikes across Germany. Uh, but this came to an end in 1914 with the war. So uh, here we are now at the uh, sort of. Uh, the really crucial turning point of uh, social democracy. And in the, in the previous, the, in the several international congresses, the uh, international, second international, worked out a strategy on how to deal with war. And in uh, Stuttgart Resolution of 1907, Copenhagen of 1910, and then uh, ba Basel Resolution of 1913. They basically kept more or less the same position in war throughout this period. And even the right wingers in the German delegation voted for this. Well, at least the whole of the German delegation voted for it. But they voted en bloc, so... But it read like, uh, well, there are two paragraphs that are repeated in at least two of these resolutions. And it says that if war threatens to break out, it is the duty of the working classes and their parliamentary representatives to exert every effort to prevent the outbreak of war 
by the means they consider most effective. Uh, there is a question mark here. It's, it's very difficult actually to prevent a massive imperialist world war from breaking out. Particularly on the, in a time of war, the bourgeois, the press, and the whole of the establishment pull together. And it really is extremely likely that you can actually prevent, uh, unlikely you could prevent the outbreak of a war. Even on the relatively favorable conditions. So the left had included a, a writing also about what would happen if the war were to break out. So then it is the duty of the workers and the representatives to intervene in favor of the war's speedy termination and with all their powers utilize the economic and political crisis to rouse the masses and thereby hasten the downfall of capitalist rule. Yes, it was in 1907 and in 1930, but yeah, I think it was, yeah. And uh, Lenin had his doubts about whether this would be implemented. In 1913, after the Basel Resolution, he wrote, They have given us a large promissory note. Let us see how they meet it. Well, Lenin's skepticism was well founded. In fact, part of the reason why the German party could vote in favor of this resolution was because it uh, excluded any binding commitment to any particular form of action. Which the left had the left had repeatedly tried to introduce it into the resolutions. In particular, agitation among soldiers, which was carried out in other countries, and of course the general strike. And so any kind of measures that threaten direct confrontation with the state were vetoed by the German delegation, effectively. Legian was the leader of the German trade union movement. And he was uh, on the right throughout this whole process. In 1915, he uh, said about uh, the war vote. <laughs> 
the whole of the party apparatus would have been destroyed. And he ridiculed the idea of an underground organization. saying it was an obviously anarchist idea. To wreck the organization in order to bring about a solution to the problem of the masses. And Lenin commented. Yeah, Lenin, yeah. Sorry. Um, I'm going to try to. Okay. People are so degraded by bourgeois legality that they cannot even concede, think of, think of. The need for re organizations of a different kind. <laughs> Illegal organizations <laughs> for the purpose of guiding the revolutionary struggle. And so you can see here, the po Russian party has a strong <coughs> history and a tradition of the illegal activities. The whole history of the Russian party was a struggle, or like a rapid turns between legality and illegality. <laughs> But the German party, for a whole period of legality, was desperately worried of the effects of a turn to illegality. And uh, but there was a big gap between the leadership and the rank and file on this question. The workers, the workers didn't see the party as an end of itself. But as a means to an end. And if you cannot achieve your end with the party, then it's no good, is it? So one of the parliamentary deputies complained that if he had voted against the war credits, he would have been put in prison. And one Berlin worker replied, What would be so bad about that? So, and those who did vote against the war, or opposed the war, uh, were imprisoned. First Liebknecht and then Luxembourg. Okay, yeah. But obviously this broke the whole of the international apart. So half the international was on one side of the war. And half the international was in the other side of the war. And the the one that was on the Entente tent side on the Germany, uh, no, sorry, France, Britain, etc. Mm -hmm. 
They even uh, convened an international gathering without inviting the Germans and those on the other side. And Lenin commented that they are running the errands of the Roman bourgeoisie. Um, and uh, another, a new international was needed. <laughs> but in, all, uh, in uh, almost all countries, the internationalists became a very small uh, uh, fraction of the parties. <laughs> They often uh, suffered persecution as well from the state. <coughs> Only in the neutral countries where they sp spared it. Uh, but whereas the opportunists, uh, those who voted for the war, they were often given government positions and so on. So inevitably, at the early stages of the war, the internationalists were massively reduced compared to the uh, chauvinists. And this is why Lenin joked that he could fit all the internationalists of the world into two stagecoaches. The first Sim Simmenwald conference had around 40 delegates. 40 delegates around. I guess the Swiss comrades would know. But uh, Simmerwald is a little village in the hills above Baum. So in order to get up the hills, they had to literally pack all the delegates into two stagecoaches. <laughs> Uh, the conference of Simmerwald was uh, composed of a mixture of elements. But at this stage, some of the people who had earlier on supported the war had moved, uh, moved over to anti-war camp. So you found that Simmerwald, some of the uh, centre uh, in uh, the conference, not just the left, but also the centre. And that included in particular uh, Ledenur, is that it? Ledebauer. Ledebauer, okay. Ledebauer, but also the Mensheviks were in the conference. So inevitably there was going to be some uh, discussions as to the nature of the resolution that passed. And the left produced um, a draft manifesto. Uh, which was signed by uh, people like uh, Sinoviev and Lenin, Radek from the Polish group, Winter uh, from Latvia, Seta uh, Höglund from Sweden, Seth Höglund. <laughs> Neerman as Norway. And Platten uh, from Switzerland. Platten. 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 
And one German delegate who isn't named. I remember now, neither Luxembourg nor Liebknecht could participate in this conference. Liebknecht obviously being in prison. Uh, Trotsky also um, voted for this manifesto uh, eventually. Uh, although he wasn't part of the left at this time. And this manifesto stated things very clearly. It stated that the, the war is an imperialist war. Wait for the political and economic exploitation of the world. It is not a question of national independence, defense of the fatherland, as, as the opportunists had justified the war. It also contained a very clear writing about the role that the opportunists had played. It said they were prejudiced by nationalism and brought them with opportunism. They betrayed the proletariat to imperialism. And gave up the principles of socialism. And like the previous manifestos, it maintained that the revolutionary course was the way out. Civil war, not civil peace, that is the slogan. So. It, uh, it opposed the idea of disarmament. Or the idea that you can somehow get a no negotiated peace that will last. And so, in retrospect, you can say that, that uh, there was yet another, there was another world war after this, which proved exactly the point. Not to mention the fact that it took another, it took uh, two revolutions to bring an end to the First World War. But this manifesto was voted down by the uh, majority of the conference. Opposed. And the manifesto that was adopted was actually was quite was well quite different. Rather well, opposing the question of a civil war, revolution. Rather than posing the question of civil war and revolution as a way out, it was basically putting forward a pacifist position. The other manifesto, the left manifesto, starts with a sentence that it's an imperialist war. The majority manifesto says Europe is like a gigantic human slaughterhouse. War is horrible. Which is undoubtedly true, but it's not exactly the point. It also talks about the reconciliation of peoples. It's a struggle for freedom, for reconciliation of peoples. And any lasting peace 
is only possible if every thought of violating the rights and liberties of nations is condemned. It's a bit like trying to get a wolf to become a vegetarian. Trying to stop the imperialist powers from being imperialist. And to respect and to respect the rights of the colonies to self-determination. The self right of self-determination in nations must be the indestructible principle in the system of national relationships of peoples. So there's no question here of revolution or class struggle. But on the question of war, it's a question of uh, peace versus war. Still, it did, uh, did condemn the war. It did condemn the war, because the manifesto condemned the war. And it um, uh, 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 supported the mobilizing of the working class in order to end the war. It placed the blame of the war at the capitalist class. And it uh, encouraged the proletarian unity across uh, borders. So for this reason, Lenin and the left supported the manifesto. They too put in a note, though, uh, explaining their position. And it, uh, it, uh, it criticized it from containing no uh, pronouncement on opportunism. Um, which is the chief cause of the collapse of the previous international. And which strives to perpetuate that collapse. But still, they voted in favor. Because we regard it as a call to struggle. And in this struggle, we are anxious to march side by side with the other sections of the international. This was signed Lenin, Sinoviev, Radek, Neumann, Höglund and Winter. So the Marxist position at Simmerwald was defended by six delegates. Uh, also, Trotsky wrote his own um, position on the manifesto. Uh, which I'm not going to read. Because it's not as good. Um, but you can see here that the Marxism at this point in time was defended by very few individuals in the leading in the leadership. But uh, in the mass of the working class in the coming years, this tiny group of six individuals. Developed into a mass international. 
Only about four years later, we have the founding of the Third International. Which, uh, within a couple of years, had mass affiliations from France, Norway. The uh, centrist parties uh, applied for affiliation to the Third International. So from these six, within uh, ten years, you had millions of workers associated with the Third International. In, in particular, based on the experiences of the Russian Revolution. which actually proved every single point that the left had been making throughout this entire period. And so, um, if we try to, to try to summarize, that was very timely. Um, the life is full of crisis, birth, adolescence, death, and so on. Maybe I should say teenagers, year, teenage years rather than adolescence. <laughs> and it's the same for a revolutionary party. Every turn in the situation brings about crises and splits. And undoubtedly, if the German party majority had decided to vote no to the credit, if, if in, the Germ in 1914 the majority of the German party had voted no, it would undoubtedly have been a split of the right wing immediately. In the period of illegality, they would have also been reduced in force. But on that basis, they could have re-emerged at the time of the revolution. As a far more united and cohesive force. Uh, in the end, it took uh, several years to bring about the mass Marxist party in Germany again. It's only after the um, uh, Spartacus uh, formation, Spartacus League, had managed to win over the USPD that you got a Communist Party in Germany. So the Independent Socialist Party, which was the party of Kautsky, was won over by the Communists in 1921 or I think it's 1922, is it? Yeah. No, 1920. 20. Okay. Okay. So, uh, October 20. 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 The shift in situation from uh, peaceful, gradual, legal development to a revolutionary period uh, posed completely new challenges for the party. And the lead and the leadership of the Second International was not prepared to face this. Okay. 
And in order to protect uh, privileged positions and the organizations? Uh, they sided with the ruling class against the working class. And in many ways, this has a lot of parallels with today. Although, at present, very, few, very, very few of the mass parties of the working class claim to be Marxist. But the basic uh, problem remains the same. And what it teaches us is the need to build and educate a revolutionary party develop a cadre organization steal the Marxist theory but also a party which is not afraid to take up theoretical discussions which doesn't hide our differences but openly discusses them in order to clarify our ideas. And only in that way can you build a proper revolutionary party.